patient hurts a lot less than an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. It beats me, I think, you see that every day, like how those five pancreas incisions hurt more than that cutting off your joint, putting in a new implant. It's just, it's so much less painful. Anyway, shoulder instability. This is usually a subject that is the, the, uh, the course for a grand round for an hour and a half talk, so we're gonna cram a lot of information in 15 minutes. The shoulder is composed of four joints. Everybody focuses on the glenohumeral joint, but truly, whenever you raise the arm, the motion occurs through four joints. It starts with your sternoclavicular, acromioclavicular, glenohumeral, and finally, your shoulder blade moves on the thoracic cage, the scapulothoracic. Instability can involve all four joints. We're not gonna talk about scapulothoracic. When your scapula is separated from your thorax, that's usually some sort of internal amputation that you rarely see in trauma centers, so we're not gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about the other three. SC joint, usually that's obvious on physical exam, but you do need special views. You're not gonna pick that up on plain x-rays, and I'm gonna show you some examples. It can be anterior or posterior instability. They usually both occur as a result of trauma. The posterior dislocations are usually locked, meaning it's, it doesn't go in and out of socket. It's posterior and stays posterior, and that needs to be reduced in the operating room, and I'll show you why. The anterior dislocations sometimes take less trauma. Sometimes, sometimes the joint dislocates as a result of arthritis. It kind of wears out the, the anterior joint capsule and uh, slips in and out of the socket. And it's usually better tolerated, and we can try to treat this non-operatively. We try to ignore that. We try not to operate on that, uh, but surgery is possible. Here's an example of sternoclavicular joint instability, anterior on the top. The middle end of the clavicle is prominent under the skin, and particularly when you compare that to the other side, it's very obvious. The x-rays are pretty normal. Unless you get a CAT scan that shows the middle end of the clavicle being anteriorly or posteriorly dislocated, you're not gonna be able to see that on just an x-ray. But the exam is very obvious. Uh, go back one, please. Yeah. So um, this is an example of a posterior dislocation. You can see the middle end of the clavicle is posterior to the sternum, and that uh, clavicle end is directly abutting the great vessels. It's usually right on the subclavian artery and uh, vein. And uh, there can be an occult vascular injury, like the, 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 the bone is like creating a small rent in the vessel, and when you reduce it, I can start to bleed profusely, and that is the reason why we put them back in the operating room uh, with a vascular surgeon and backup. Uh, the nice thing about the posterior dislocations is that once it's back in socket, it stays in the socket. That's usually stuff for trauma centers. You're not gonna see that in private practice, civilian practice a lot. AC instability, that is the most frequent instability of the AC joint, dislocating your AC joint like John did. Uh, there's six types. I keep messing up this button. There's six types. Type one is just a sprain of the structure. Type two, you rupture the AC joint capsule, but you have the ligaments between your coracoid and the clavicle, the so-called CC, coracoclavicular ligaments, being intact. So although it's sprained and painful, the alignment is maintained. In type three and type five, you have a complete failure of all of those, like the capsule and those ligaments are gone. And so the clavicle stays in place, but what happens is that the shoulder blade and the arm droops down away from the position of the clavicle. The difference between the three and five is that there's, what the, the books don't depict is that there's a, like a fascia on top of that, the insertion of the delta and the trapezius on the AC joint, and that fascia can somehow preserve the alignment. When you tear the fascia as well, it creates a much more obvious deformity and drooping of the shoulder blade, and I have an example of that. So that's the difference between the three and the five is the amount of displacement. This is usually about, the, the clavicle springs up by about 100%, and this is at least 300% usually. These rare dislocations, the four and six, I've never encountered them. They're described in books. In the type four, the clavicle dislocates straight posteriorly. You may, in fact, miss that on the plain x-ray, because on the AP view, it looks relatively normal, but on the axillary view, uh, the clavicle will be uh, dislocated posteriorly into the trapezius. Type six, I don't even know how that happens, but it can happen. The clavicle can come to lie underneath the coracoid. Very violent injuries. So this is the difference between a type three and a type five. This is a normal shoulder. You're looking for symmetry, and although this guy's AC joints are bulbous like mine, they're symmetric. On this one, the clavicle is there, but the, there's a bigger distance between the acromion and the clavicle right over there, and that's how the x-ray looks like. You can see that the joint there is sprung, whereas there it's located. So that when it's sprung, that's a type three dislocation. This is a type five. That to that, the difference is bigger, and the, the, the distance from the clavicle to the acromion is at least 300% usually.
So these type three injuries, that's the most frequent AC separation that we see, we try to treat them non-operatively. And when the patient comes back a few weeks later, nine out of 10 times, they do quite well with non-operative management. They don't go back to normal, but they're a whole lot better to the point where they can resume useful activities, perhaps even uh, athletic activities, uh, and don't require surgery. We tend to reserve surgery for those type threes only for that subset of patient that doesn't improve with expectant management. Type fives, they typically need to go to the operating room right away. And uh, we used to do many complicated surgeries, and there's like 100, time, 100 variations of that, but now we have all evolved and pretty much do one surgery. We try to recreate, um, we try to reduce the joint between the acromion and the clavicle indirectly without exposing the actual joint. And then we place a loop of tissue and suture from the, the clavicle around the coracoid. And we do that nowadays, believe it or not, arthroscopic assisted. So that little incision there, we can sort of uh, tunnel underneath the coracoid. And using the arthroscope and special instruments, we can shuttle suture and the graft and create a loop of tissue that holds the clavicle reduced and everything scars back in place. And that's probably the most frequent way to fix this injury nowadays. Glenohumeral instability. So um, this is what most people refer to as I dislocated my shoulder. It's re re dislocating the glenohumeral joint. The most important thing to do in this case is, is to get a very thorough history on the first event. Many people miss that. You have to be thorough about how did the injury occur, what was the position of the arm, and then was it a true dislocation where the shoulder could not be put back in place, you went to an emergency room, there's documented x-rays with a dislocation and an emergency room physician put it back in place versus the patient thinks the shoulder joint slipped out of socket and then they put it back in place. Very different. Documented dislocation versus the patient perceiving it as a dislocation. You gotta have good plane films and you must have axillary films or you, uh, or you will lose dislocations. So what I want, to do, the primary care physicians in the room is when they go back to their practices, if they write the scripts themselves or if they have their office managers write the scripts, whenever you're ordering, you wanna make sure you order a Grashi AP view, an axillary, and a Y view. Those two, particularly the first ones, are very important. And I'll, I'll show you examples why. Then the treatment of the dislocation depends on the patient age, activity level, and the magnitude of the bone and soft tissue injury. And most of the times we can treat people non-operatively. So we're gonna talk a little bit about glenohumeral instability, static versus dynamic stabilizers that Dr. Mile alluded to. This is the ball and socket joint. Truly, the socket in this joint is very flat. And I like to liken it to like a golf ball on a golf tee. If you have like any type of deficiency of that golf tee, like in cases of uh, bony bankard or injuries of the glenoid socket, it's very easy for the ball to slide off and uh, dislocate. And that happens in a shoulder joint just like uh, in a golf ball on a golf tee. You gotta have all of the bone on the shoulder socket. It's every millimeter of bone counts on the glenoid. This is the labrum and the ligaments. When you take the ball out of the socket, the socket is only this big. The labrum composes actually about 20% of the joint surface. More so, it's like an O-ring on the shoulder socket. It deepens the shoulder socket and it gives it more concavity. So that it's, it, there's more space for the shoulder to, to, to sit on, for the ball of the humerus to sit on rather than not having your, your labrum. And you can see how all those ligaments, anteriorly and posteriorly, they, they take off from the labrum. So whenever you tear the labrum off from the shoulder socket as part of a dislocation, it detensions the ligaments and that's how you get an instability. Most cases of instability, they happen anteriorly and inferiorly and you tear the labrum right about there. It rips off the bone. And then dynamic stability is conferred by the rotator cuff muscles. They all compress the ball in the socket and they help to keep it maintained and that's where uh, therapy is directed at, is getting your uh, scapulothoracic stabilizers and then the rotator cuff muscles strong again to, to compress the ball in the socket. So immediate surgery for the glenohumeral joint, we do that only when there is a very large, unstable bankard injury, and I will show you that. Or a very large rotator cuff tear, and that's something that you can pick up on physical exam and an x-ray. You really need an MRI to decide. Like in the first visit, patient comes into the office to see me with a shoulder dislocation. From a physical exam and an x-ray, I know if they're gonna need surgery right away or not. Um, uh, most patients, we try to treat them non-operatively in a sling for four to six weeks and rehab them. And we tend to reserve surgery for instability if the instability is recurrent. And in those cases, in those recurrent instability cases, then we need an MR arthrogram and a CAT scan to look for bony deficiencies. 
So this is what we call a bankard and a heel sax. When you dislocate your shoulder, the ball will come to lie on the front of the glenoid, and the glenoid edge is very sharp and hard bone, whereas the cancellous bone on the humerus is soft. So the glenoid leaves a divot in the uh, humerus, that's called a heel sax lesion, and the area where the labrum is avulsed is called a bankard injury. Sometimes the labrum can take a small piece of bone from the anterior inferior edge with it, and that's called a bankard fracture. That's an example of a small piece of bone of the anterior inferior glenoid and an indentation on the uh, humeral head. This is how you uh, properly image the glenohumeral joint. This is a true shoulder AP where the beam comes just perpendicular to your trunk. The joint itself, however, is inclined about 30 degrees this way. So if you get a true perpendicular view to the joint, now you can actually see the joint space between the glenoid and the humerus. And that view is very important. So when you order an AP, it needs to be a grassy AP. It's called a grassy view. And this is how you can miss a dislocation if you don't get an axillary view. You just get like this AP view, it looks a little funky, perhaps even some widening of the glenohumeral joint space. You get an axillary view, the joint is completely dislocated. I mean, that's the socket, that's the ball. But if you don't get that view, it can actually be missed. So make sure you order axillaries. Uh, anterior dislocations, the appearance of the joint, even on the AP view, is typically not normal, but they too can go undetected. Dr. Mal was just showing me a case of a patient who went to an emergency room and they completely missed the anterior dislocation. But the appearance is not as subtle as a posterior dislocation. Posterior dislocations are easier to miss. So this is some examples of how we surgically fix these shoulder instabilities. So in cases where you have normal bone, you just have the uh, labrum avulsed from the socket, we do that arthroscopically. This is a pure labral tear or a pure bunkard injury. We'll go in arthroscopically, mobilize the labrum, we'll put suture anchors, shadow sutures around it, and then we'll uh, bring that O-ring back to the shoulder socket and we'll create like a nice bumper here and deep in the shoulder socket. You see it's not quite flat, the, the labrum is protruding off from the uh, surface of the uh, glenoid. That's what you want, you want to create like a little uh, concavity there. In cases where there's also a large defect in the humeral head, when you look at the shoulder joint, that defect in the humeral head can actually engage uh, and uh, dislocate because you're missing an arc of articular surface. So what you can do is you can fill that in with the rotator cuff. Again, arthroscopically, we'll put in uh, anchors into the humeral head and sutures will go through uh, into the humeral head through the rotator cuff and they will insert the rotator cuff into the defect. And then, then what that does is we uh, shorten the articular arc but we make the defect now extra articular and you can no longer engage. That's called a, a remplissage procedure and that's also done arthroscopically. In cases where there's a large bony bankard like this, we can actually fix those, fix those arthroscopically. You can usually just put sutures uh, around that piece and compress them into the shoulder socket and fix that. And this is a very rare case, one of my favorite cases to do though, uh, when you have cases where the glenoid is uh, missing bone from uh, multiple dislocations, uh, the golf tee is eroded and it, the shoulder just slides in and out of the socket very easily. So what you have to do is you have to replace like with like and we have to do a glenoid graft. And there's many types, but I like to use this distal tibia. We found out in the lab that the distal tibia matches perfectly the humeral head and you can simply cut out that piece and put that in. It usually involves open surgery and give them a new shoulder socket. Let's see if it advances. So in summary, there's four joints you want to refer patients like that to an orthopedic surgeon. The treatment depends on which joint is dislocated, and most patients can be treated non-operatively. What I want to stress out is that in younger patients, the most typical problem is recurrent instabilities, and by younger we mean under 25. In patients who are older, 40 or above, their problem tends to be tearing their rotator cuff. The, the dislocation tends to stabilize non-operatively, but in most patients who are over 40, we need to carefully examine the rotator cuff and make sure they don't have an acute traumatic rotator cuff tear. And that is typically what is required is a rotator cuff repair in patients over 40, not, not a shoulder stabilization surgery. That's reserved for the younger athletic population. Thank you.